in a world more interconnected than ever before. We are unexpectedly affected by things that we cannot see and things we do not know. But there is a world beyond the public eye, a place that the media tells you to fear, a no-go zone. Follow Mike, a world traveler, bringing us to no-go zone stateside and abroad. A travel documentary series that breaks barriers. Mike goes to the places that others are afraid of, where no one else dares to go, to tell their story, the story the media forgets to tell you. See the other side of places like Baltimore, Southside Chicago, Opalaka, Syria, and more at MikeNoGoZones.com or Mike No Go Zones on YouTube. It was also time to meet up with my friend Nick, who's also a journalist based here in Kyiv, and for him to give me the lowdown on everything going on here. You may remember him from my Kabul episode, where he made a brief cameo. Please follow his Instagram for the best coverage on the Ukraine conflict. Here we are having a very informative lunch in central Kyiv. All right, here with my buddy Nick. It's been a while. It's been, it's been quite a while, yeah. Uh, since uh, we last hung out was in Istanbul. Istanbul, that was getting on two years ago now. Yeah, it's been too long. We can't, uh, we shouldn't let that much time elapse again. But anyway, um, question I was curious. Uh, we texted earlier. He, you said, is out of range of the shelling, so. Yeah. It's so, yeah, Kiev has like a, a very, very normal vibe, at least it on does. first impression. Mm. It doesn't look, as we were talking about, like it's been badly destroyed or damaged at all. One of the reasons for that is that the Russians never got their artillery in range of the city. When mm. they attacked the city last February, they got stopped at the satellite towns of Erpin and Bucha, and so they never came in range of the central city itself. Mm. Now, while they can occasionally attack it with missiles, Kiev has pretty good air defences, so in the main, mm. the centre of the city is pretty safe and secure. Right. Now, it can, can sometimes be a bit crazy because, for instance, three days ago, they attacked with a massive missile strike, but the Ukrainians were able to shoot most of those down, and there were at least no civilian casualties. That oh, that's happened. great. Oh, good. Now, one thing I'm surprised, um, usually when these situations happen, you have IDP, internally displaced people. Yeah. Is that an issue? Are they coming? It's quite a bit of an issue, yeah. So what's okay. happened is that when there's there's obviously still a lot of fighting going on, right. the fighting is mainly confined now to the east of the Donbass region and right. to the south, the Zaporizhia Kherson region. Mm. And so there have been a lot of people that have left those regions and they've come to Kiev. Or they've gone to further west to places like Lviv or even down to Odessa mm. or Dnipro in the center, which are like very, very relatively safe places at least right. by Ukrainian standards. And, uh also to other countries too. I mean, uh, the whole East, whole Europe has seen an influx of refugees. No, I think there were at one point about eight million refugees, but I oh. believe at least half of those have oh. since returned. Okay. Wow. It's just it, it blows my mind. But um, are they staying in refugee camps? Are there camps being set up, or like? Normally not. So okay. most of the people have managed to get accommodation in mm. some way or form. I mean, the Euro European Union has been very, very generous. There. There's quite a generous housing allowance for most refugees. Okay. And there's quite a lot of empty real estate, even in places like Kiev, just because so many people are still there. Right. So, no, you, you don't have things that you would see in like Yemen or Afghanistan. Right, or Saudi Afghanistan or... Got, like, or the, you know, ten, ten, you know, Ten cities, yeah, the, yeah. Cities. That, that's not really yeah, a thing. Yeah, unbelievable. Sometimes there are very temporary ones that people stay in for a few days mm. in places like Fabrizia until they can get some more permanent accommodation. Right. But that's not a major issue in general. You know, IDPs and refugees have probably an easier time of it than they would in some of the True. Some of okay. The Interesting. Interesting. And uh, this whole uh, Bakhmut. Uh, What's going on? I, mean, I keep seeing that name pop up in the news cycle. It's, uh, I guess, a stronghold for Ukraine to hold off the well, Russians? It very much was up until this weekend, okay. but it does appear that Ukraine have lost pretty much the entire city. So Bakhmut mm. is a city in eastern Ukraine in the Donbass region okay. where oh, Ukraine yeah. has been fighting off and trying to hold the Russian forces to attack this city. Wow. It's already probably the bloodiest battle in the world in the 21st century so far. Jeez. Jesus Christ. Tens of thousands of men have died in that battle. Uh, we do, it's very hard to know the exact casualty figures because no side ever tells the truth about them. True. And it appears that the Russians took the city over the weekend. And most Ukrainians seem to acknowledge that by now. Now the question is, of course, they you know probably they had tens of 
thousands of casualties there from what one small city in the east. And so right. the question would be, was it worth it for them? Yeah. The Ukrainian strategy was to try and tie down and exhaust Russian forces in Bakhmut. So what that means mm. is that they can, Ukrainian forces can potentially attack now on other axes when the Russian army is at its weakest. Mm. The decision to stay in Bakhmut and fight for that long was very controversial, and until the Ukrainian counter-offensive comes to an end or we see results from that, it's going to be very hard to know whether that was the right decision for the Ukrainian high command or not. Mm. Wow. Is there a foreseeable end to this? It's just, it looks like it's going to keep on going till... Uh, so what's probably going yeah. to... So I, I think there's one or two scenarios. I think we can more or less rule out Russia making any crushing further gains. Mm. If they had a chance to do that, they had a chance when they were attacking over the winter with right. the 300,000 mobilized reserves. Mm. That didn't really seem to get anywhere except for taking a little bit of ground in Bakhmut. Mm. One option is that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is wildly successful, and what would happen is that Ukraine would take back large amounts of territory in the south and maybe even be in a position to attack Crimea, which the Russians have occupied mm. right, in 2014, or mm. attack the cities of Donetsk and Luhansk, which have also been occupied since 2014. However, if this counteroffensive fails, you're probably going to get to a stage within six months mm. to a year, where both forces effect sides effectively run out of ammunition, they run out of men that can fight mm. the army, they run out of tanks and gear yeah, and exactly. everything like that. And in that case, it would probably, there will probably be some sort of ceasefire, mm. potentially a Korea-style armistice. Right. Now, mm. even if the Ukrainian public doesn't really want to agree to that, they might have no choice because mm. the Ukrainian army is just too exhausted. Yeah. At the same time, the Russian army is probably too exhausted to make further Jeez. gains either. Unbelievable. I, I just can't believe it's lasted this long as is. It's just, yeah. it's unreal. And uh, one crazy thing I see, uh, I follow some interesting people on Twitter that I have totally different ideologies from. Uh, I'm not going to say her name, but she's pretty well known. First name's Vanessa. Uh, very pro-Russian. And she loves to spread this whole myth that everyone here is a, a Nazi and uh, this and that. And uh, they, they, uh, the propaganda I've seen by the pro-Russian against this country. It's just, it's insane, like, uh, how, you know, that they're uh, coming here to, to liberate the people, and it's, yeah. it's a war of liberation. I'm just, really? By destroying their country, you're liberating them? I mean, it's kind of, well, yeah, yeah it's kind of weird, you know, weird twisted logic to it, you know? Mm -hmm. but, yeah, so the, the, the interesting thing was, is that when you go back to 2014, mm -hmm. it's, it's sometimes useful to explore sort of the roots of what happened, mm -hmm. and the reason why Russian propaganda picked up on this idea of like a Nazi ideology. Yeah. What happened is that back in 2014, Russia fomented this rebellion with their own regular forces mm. and with separatist forces in the east. Mm. Now, the Ukrainian army at that point didn't really exist very well. Right. It was yeah, the, the country was in a political crisis, the army was very, very weak, mm. and what ended up happening is that a, a lot of local, effectively, militias right. joined together, mm. and some of those, the founders of them, had some quite nasty, quite far-right ideologies. Mm. Okay, them. okay, so... However, However, since then, the influence of those groups has waned substantially. Many of them, but the most famous one is, of course, the Azov Battalion, have been right. regularized into the modern army. However, the Russian propaganda has oh, it's, picked it's, it's, up on those since 2014. It's like, they're, uh, it's like the story that never ends with them, you know? Exactly, exactly. And now, what has happened since then, of mm. course, is I exactly the people that they say they've come to liberate, well, uh, the people of the Donbass, well, no area in Ukraine has been more badly damaged or destroyed to the ground than the mm. Donbass. And the irony is mm. that there were plenty of people in the Donbass, e even before this war, who, if they not wanted to be part of Russia, but wanted to maintain friendly relations sure. with Russia, wanted sure. to maintain neutrality with Russia, right. and the, the entire idea of pro-Russian politics in Ukraine has just completely gone away because people have seen the destruction. Sure. It's like, I want to be your friend, but I'm slapping you in the head, you know? Exactly. The, you know, it doesn't exactly. make sense. Yeah. And some of the destruction that maybe you'll see if you go out that way yeah. is just unbelievable to behold. You can just go down through towns and towns and towns and just be absolutely white from the mm. earth. Jeez.
Unbelievable. All right, I think we got plenty of material. <laughs> there you go. Actually, there was. I'm going to keep going on that. Oh, sure, 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 there sure. Was just one thing that I wanted to share because it's always been something that struck me very well. Sure. Is that I remember one of the most kind of interesting and eye-opening experiences for me as a reporter was in the first in the first couple of weeks of the war. Mm. I went to Kharkiv, which is the second biggest city in Ukraine. It's in the east, mm. and it is an almost entirely Russian-speaking city. It was, and because it's so close to the Russian border, a lot of right. people had friends and family. Sure, in sure, Russia. ethnic ties, yeah. And one thing that would shock me is how so many people would say my father, my daughter, my brother or whoever is in Russia mm. and they refuse to believe me when they, when I tell them what's going on mm. I would show them photos of my destroyed house and they'd be like, well, that video is a fake, Jeez. it's Nazis who did this, oh my God, army don't... is bombing you, not us, Russia's only there to help you out mm. and there's been so many, you know, all of the kind of historical and cultural ties between Russia and Ukraine sure. been decimated by this war. Unbelievable because they were, you know Brothers, uh, it, the, well, some, or you know, or closely related, you know, uh, the, ethnically, was, linguistically, yeah, was, uh, uh, religiously, you know, really, yeah, there you were know. plenty of, and, and that's actually when you bring up religiously. I remember uh, talking to a priest whose church mm. in Kharkiv, whose church had been bombed, and he was just kind of in a state of anger and despair, being mm. like, I can't believe that the patriarch in Moscow, who we admired, is right. supporting this war. I can't believe that they're bombing, you know, all of these streets with the names of Pushkinskaya, Dostoevskaya, Ulitsa, with the names of all of these. You know, they're bombing to the, their own culture and heritage to pieces. God, it's unbelievable. Unreal. Cool. Man, you said... Uh... Here you go.